Hi guys, and welcome to Drink Forex. I'm here with Jason Sin. He is the owner and founder of Day Trade Ideas, and he is also a trader himself and provides news analysis. How's it going, Jason? Hi. Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Where are you joining us from? Uh, I'm sitting in Phuket in Thailand. Okay, very nice. Are you originally from Thailand or how did you end no, up No, no, my Thailand? dad's Chinese. I was born in London. Uh, but long story. Well, basically, we moved here about two years ago. I've got a wife and two kids and uh, for one reason or another, we moved here. We thought it would be a good place to live. So far, so good. We love it. Okay, very nice. Thailand uh, seems like an excellent place. I, I personally have not been there, but definitely uh, a place I'd like to visit. Yeah, uh, you got to come, come in scuba. Yeah, yeah, we we're, were talking off camera. Uh, I've been into scuba diving, so I want to go over to Thailand and do a couple of the dives there. They have uh, amazing diving. Uh, are they you really into, do. Are you into scuba diving? I did my first dive about six months ago and loved it. Yeah, my kid, my <laughs> my ten year old son's done a couple of dives now. He's getting into it. Yeah, it's a tremendous place for that. Okay, very nice. Well, when I come over, we'll have to go diving together. Done. Very nice. Um, are you having a drink by chance? I am. I'm having a drink. What, what, what are you drinking today? Some wine. Red wine. <laughs> is, you is wine see, you can the... see I've had some already. <laughs> is, uh, I, I personally am drinking coffee. It's 7.30 in the morning here. so Yeah. It's, it's not quite wine for you. Yeah. I, I know it's <laughs> 5 o'clock somewhere. Just <laughs> yeah. Not, not well, here. It's 6.30 here. That's all. nearly 7 o'clock now in the evening. Nice. Are, are you typically a wine drinker? Uh, I was a wine drinker when we used to live in Spain because it was so cheap um, and beer tends to pile the pounds on, especially when you're my age. Uh, <laughs> but wine here has like a 300% import tax or something. Oh, seriously? So, yeah. So I, for that reason, I don't drink a lot of wine anymore, unfortunately, and I drink a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm surprised by that with Australia being so close and having such good wine. Yeah, there's great wine, but there's an imp such a big import tax on it that uh, it's it's expensive. So yeah, I'm afraid those days are over for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you've lived in Thailand, Spain, any other places? Nope, just those two countries. Okay, very nice. And that's mm. uh, you know that's one of the good things about FX is you can travel around and continue to do your job. That's, uh... Yeah, that's terrific. Actually, we always said uh, when we, I used to work on the uh, London International Financial Futures Exchange, and uh, you know, obviously, open outcry then. Computers were a pretty new thing. Um, you know, we always used to talk about how we, oh, one day we'll be doing this from a beach. You know, <laughs> in, you didn't really think it would happen, but hey, it, it did happen, and that's why I thought, well, I'm getting out of London. I'm going to go somewhere where the sun shines. <laughs> now, now you're doing it by a pool. I so yeah, there you go. It's, Not too bad. Very nice. And that actually leads me into a good question. How did you get your start into this industry? Um, okay, so it's really my father. Um, uh, I started in 1987, so at that age, let me see now, I was 19. And, uh, you know, I, like most kids, I wanted to make some money. I uh, didn't really know how, but, you know, I saw my father trading and realized that was a way that you could make some money if you got it right. So um, I was kind of interested in finance and numbers and stuff. So I wrote my, I sent my CV off to um, dozens of, of uh, sort of investment banks in London, and one bank took me on. Uh, I didn't really know what the role would be. I was just happy to have got a job. I turned up first day. It was um, the company was called Shepherds and Chase. They were situated on Number One London Bridge, so really plush office, right in the centre of the city. And the first day I turned up, suit, you know, tie. <laughs> I was a teenager. I didn't know what the hell was going on. The next thing, uh, after about an hour, they said, right, come with us. And I, I, I've walk, they walked me down to the stock exchange floor. And suddenly I'm you know, on the stock exchange floor, which I've only ever, ever seen on the TV. So it's all, all pretty exciting. And, and uh, yeah, so I discovered that my job was to train as an options broker. Okay, very nice. Is that typical that you wear a suit and tie in London? Because I know come from the Chicago side of the business, I showed up my first day for my interview and literally the person I was interviewing with told me, oh, I see you bought a new suit for the interview. You might as well okay. throw that away. You'll never wear it again. <laughs> yeah, but you're probably about 20 or 30 years younger than me, so things have changed <laughs> in that time. I'm pretty sure you didn't start working in 1987. No, no. I was uh, right after the financial collapse in 2009. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you're talking, talking a couple of decades at least uh, later. So uh, things, things change and more casual. I, I don't think in the city you wear suits that much anymore. I think pretty much these hedge fund guys have a casual okay. uh, dress. 
And you've so you went to options, but you've traded a host of products, right? Like you've done, have you done equities, futures, uh, FX? What are all the various products that you've actually traded? Um, well, when I started on the floor, yeah, it was options, and the options were relatively new in London. So um, you know, I, I kind of I was just lucky. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. That was purely it. Um, and I didn't find them easy to learn, you know. Um, and there was the, the training was mostly chuck you in the pit and see how you get on. So <laughs> you kind of had to figure it out for yourself. I mean, you did get a bit of training. You know, you found out what a butterfly was and a cool spread and a put spread. But actual putting it into practice and, and, and you know, figuring out how to make money was, you know, down to you. So, um, yeah, I work for a company who would finance us. Uh, well, sorry, I, I started off as a broker. And then actually after the... Um, 1987 crash in October. I lost my job. It was a case case of last last in first out, and uh, I was very lucky to get taken on by a market making company. Which yeah, I suppose that changed everything because maybe otherwise I'd have carried on broking, and I consider myself lucky that I went went into trading. Um, so yeah, I traded options for um, 15 years or something, um, and then after that time, I kind of really got bored of it. Uh, you, you're never really, you know, when you're calling in the office, what's my delta, what's my gamma, you know, I need to hedge here. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'd move into futures, which I thought would be easy, and it <laughs> I, was so difficult. Just a complete, completely different game. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's an old analogy that, that when I was trading always came up because we had futures and options in the prop firm, and they're, they always said options are like chess. Futures are like checkers and just basically trying to make us feel dumb that we were trading futures. <laughs> That's brilliant, actually. Uh, I've never heard that one. And I guess it is true. Um, anyway, I had none of the skills required to trade futures. And I, yeah, I was a bit cocky. I thought because I was an options geek that I'd be able to do it. And uh, no, completely wrong. Lost money. Hadn't got a clue. Were you trading outright futures or were you spreading? How were you trading the futures market? Yeah, I was trading outright futures, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. Um, and I hadn't, I was basing my trades purely on gut feeling, sitting in front of a screen with my own money. Yeah, and all, and all that money went <laughs> very quickly. Which products were you trading? Um, well, I was always a fixed income guy. I can't remember what I was trading when I went, uh, when I was, when I did that, probably something like the Bund and. Uh, you know, in those days, the burn would move 100, 150 ticks without right. a problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, anyway, that went horribly wrong, which is what, how I got into technical analysis because I realized I'm absolutely clueless. I'm gonna, just going to keep throwing money down the drain if I do this, so I better find a way of getting an edge. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go back to options and get a job And because, you know, you need a lot of money to trade options, and uh, I didn't want to put all my money at risk. So, yeah, so I got into learning how to, to, um, to do technical analysis. So you started out as a fundamental analysis and then you moved into technical. Which yeah. do you find works better or is there a hybrid of both? Like sort of explain explain your viewpoints on, on both of those. Okay, so I used to think technical analysis was a complete load of rubbish. I thought, how can you possibly look at a price chart and figure out what's going to happen in the future? Obviously, my views have changed dramatically over the last 10, 15 years. Um, my view now really is that you can't not know the technicals. I, I personally think that the technicals lead the fundamentals in many ways. Um, you know, often I see a market turning around and no one's really talking about it too much. It's, a, you know, it's a correction and suddenly you get a big move and everyone goes, oh my God, you know, that was because of this piece of news. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it wasn't really because of that piece of news because if we, if we were in a bull trend still, that piece of news would have been disregarded. But the fact that the market was already turning and, you know, you could see the sellers were gaining the upper hand and, and now suddenly everyone's paying attention to negative news. You know, that's, that's my view. So I, I really think uh, often the, the, the technicals lead the fundamentals. Okay. Do you still pay attention to the fundamentals at all or do you just sort of disregard them at this point? Uh, I wouldn't have them uh, play any part in, in my decision making in a trade. I mean, I'm aware of them. You know, you've got to know what's going on around you. But uh, also, I'm, I'm very short term. Uh, even if I swing trade, it would only be over a few days, really. So, you know, in the short term, what the Fed's going to do is not really going to have a huge impact on my position over the next two days, perhaps, unless we're heading into an FOMC meeting or something, you know. So really, um, I think short, short term, the only thing I focus on is, is, in the, is the technicals. Okay. And then were you trading during Brexit? Or did you have the news on um, at that time or...? No, I didn't. Have, I, I wouldn't have a position over a news event like that because it's you know it's just a, a gamble, pure gamble, and there's no point in doing that. Life's hard enough, you know, as a trader without just having a straight punt. 
Uh, I did get out of my personal savings in sterling. Fortunately, I don't know. You know I didn't, wasn't even thinking about it. I just woke up that morning and thought, oh, hey, you know, I better move some money out of uh, sterling because I, I earn money in sterling, but obviously I don't spend it because I don't live there. Right. So that was that was lucky. I just switched it out, and uh, then the next day woke up and was like, "Wow, thank God I did that. I wish I <laughs> wish I did more." And then I was kicking myself because I was thinking, "How could you be so stupid? It was so easy to be short cable or be short the pound, you know, with limited upside because everyone thought that, that you know that we'd remain. So right. hey, maybe you're going to lose like two, three percent. And obviously, you know, compared to making ten or fifteen percent, I just felt so dumb. Why did I not <laughs> short it? But of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and I hadn't give it, given it enough thought. So, yeah, I was kicking myself, actually. Yeah, but, you know, you could have easily been on the other end of that. Or if, if True, but risk-reward-wise, you know, you know, you risk a, I don't know, risking a 1,000 pounds to make ten or 15,000 is a fantastic trade, and you don't get those opportunities very often. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so, true. Anyway, I didn't do it. You know, another, <laughs> another opportunity missed, one of the many. You, uh, you mentioned you get paid in pounds. What is it mm. exactly you're doing? Okay, so my core business is providing technical analysis to banks, brokers, and now a lot of retail traders. So I get up every morning, and that's another reason why working in uh, living in Phuket is good for me because I'm I have to report on about 20 markets before before Europe opens. So um, I used to have to get up even when I lived in Spain, and I was an hour ahead of London. I was still getting up at three or four in the morning to get everything done. Uh, so this is pretty cool. I can wake up at seven, eight o'clock, and take my time, get all my reports out, get all my trade ideas out uh, well before the European open. Um, I have, so I write a written report, um, I write 20 written reports across 20 markets, so each report is separate, and then I also have a service for uh, about 25 uh, followers of mine who I give specific trade recommendations to, so when I've done my 20 markets, you know, I've kind of got a feel for which I think are the best trades of the day, which, you know, I try and find half a dozen, which I think are the juiciest trades, you know, the, the lowest risk, the best potential reward, the, the best levels of the day. And I stick them on a spreadsheet, and then and then these guys trade them. Okay, so people do they just take it into consideration, or do they actually follow your trades like verbatim? I think they follow them. I mean, you know, they're pretty clear. It's a, a very clear entry point. It's very specific. Uh, my stop, my target, bang, you know, and I give two or three targets in case the trend, keep, in case the move keeps going, and they want to, you know, maybe just cover half of the first target and keep going, but. Um, you know, most of these guys have been trading for a little while. Some of them have been my clients for years, so um, it seems to work quite well. I actually only started that beginning of this year, around February, and um, yeah, as I say, I got about twenty-five people following me on that. So yeah, it works quite well. You know, it's good for people who don't have time to trawl through my report, or, or they're not interested in sitting there and scalping in, scalping out at all the levels. They just want to try and stick on a couple of trades and steal some money out of the market and be done. <laughs> Um, how have you found it working with the retail clients versus institutional? Because historically, you've only worked with institutional. Is that right? Sure, yeah. Um, it was interesting because when you've worked in an industry for, say, 20 years, and then you, you, you speak a certain jargon, you know, especially in the city, you know, um, you speak a different language. And, of course, if you, you, I thought, great, I'm sure retail traders would like this. So when I started introducing it, people were like, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? <laughs> so um, they, they didn't understand the report. It was in another language. So I've had to make the reports more understandable okay. um, and clearer. This is where you sell. This is where you buy. You know, this is where you stop. This is where you target. So um, so it was, it was good exercise, though. You know, I think it's better to make your reports clearer for everybody. And I think it's improved the service. And obviously, yeah, I've, been, I've, I've met some really nice people. So that's been cool, understanding what they need, what they want. And that actually led, then led me to write a course. When I really understood what people want, you know, need to know or want to learn, then I, I sat down last year and wrote a course, a 100-page course, put it all on video, and uh, that, that's going really well. People, you never really know um, if it's going to work or not. Uh, you know, you think, <laughs> God, I put that out there, am I going to get a load of complaints? People are going to go, oh, look, that's rubbish. I can get all this for free on the internet, you know. But uh, fortunately, everyone seems pretty happy with it. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of people out there that criticize people now on the, the internet with no face and it's just, uh, you know, behind a username, they can say whatever they want. I got that a lot when I first started <laughs> out uh, giving retail stuff. I just idiots. And I just thought, oh, you know, I, I just blocked them. I just thought, I'm not even going to bother answering you back. I'm too old. You know, I, I have had, I've had all my battles on the trading floor. I really can't be bothered with <laughs> time wasters. So, yeah, I got rid of them. But uh, now I've been doing it a few years. I don't get any, any grief from anyone, really. Yeah, no, that's good. Where do most of your clients come from? Is it mostly Thailand or? No, Thailand? all over the world. 
Uh, I'd say the majority is definitely from the UK, but but I get I've got people in like Azerbaijan and places that I'm not even sure where they are. So um, yeah, I'm really surprised at how, how how diverse our client base is. Okay, that's that's cool. Um, in terms of your personal trading, are you still doing a lot of personal trading? Or is it mostly just writing analysis? Um, you can never not trade. You know, when you're doing this kind of thing, you you, you, you see a, tra a trade and you think, ah, oh, I've just got to do that. So actually, I'm nowhere near as active as I used to be. Um, I've got other things in my life and I don't want to sit in front of a screen all day. You know, I'm 48 years old. So having done this for 30, 30 years, you don't want to spend 10 hours a day sitting in front of a screen trading everything. So yeah, I pretty I trade most of my trade signals, very small, you know, uh, but I probably will never not be able to have a small trade on somewhere. <laughs> right. I, I actually watched another video that you ran, I think for Trademo, and you mm. were you were praising being smaller in position size than what you really should be. Can you just explain a little bit about that and why you recommend that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, that was one of the hardest lessons for me to learn when I traded futures. You know, uh, it's just pure greed. You know, you're thinking, oh, you know, there's no point in me putting this position on and making this this amount because it's so small. It means nothing to me. So if I'm going to trade, I need to trade bigger. But the problem is when you start doing that, then the losses hurt, really hurt, and the trade means so much. And you just can't because you'll end up blowing your account one way or, one way or another. And I did it. I did it so many times. You know. Put trade on too big, two or three trades on too big, blow the account. Uh, so it, I don't know why it took me so long. It, it was just pure greed, uh, and eventually I figured, hey, you know, I've just got a trade so small that the trade doesn't matter. So I know if I've got a trade on and I'm not watching the screen every tick, I don't really care, you know. And if I lose, I lose. I just move on to the next trade. I can sleep at night. I'm not waking up at two in the morning checking my phone, seeing where the price is. If if that if that's what I'm doing, then I know I'm doing something right. And when I start creeping up and the size gets too big, I'm getting a bit too cocky, uh, I will get spanked, I will lose money, and it will hurt. Right. Okay. That's very, very good. Do you, um, do you add to your positions? Like, will you get into a one lot and then, all right, if it's going your way, you'll put on another one lot and then yeah. just a little bit more, put on another? Or do you There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you've got a, you know, resistance over a range of prices and, yeah, you know, I, I'm very specific with my levels, but sometimes you see something on the weekly chart and then the daily chart and thinking, ah, you know, I'm not sure which is which. So, yeah, I, I would certainly advise scaling into a, uh, a trade across a range if you, for that reason, you know, but you've always obviously got to have your risk reward in place. So there's no point in risking 50 pips if you're only going to be looking to make 40 or 50 pips. Right. You know, so, so you have to calculate the risk and put it on accordingly. Is a, I know it's probably a hard question uh, to answer, but as a general rule of thumb, like what's your risk reward? What are you sort of looking for? Is it two to one, three to one? Two to one is fantastic. Uh, and I, you know, I put that in my course. Yeah, you know, you should try and trade two to one. But I also put in my course the fact that right now, and, and this has been the case for a long time, you know, a, a couple of years at least, those trades are hard to find, especially if you're, if you're just scalping on a daily basis, you know trying to risk 30 pips to make 60 pips unfortunately it's just not easy these <laughs> days you know you're just not getting the moves and this month's been been appalling so you know one to one and a half i think is acceptable in these market conditions when, when um like at the beginning of the year when the stock markets were all over the place oh there were some corking trades i mean we were taking 20 points out of gold in a in, in 24 hours you know it was it was awesome but that unfortunately didn't last very long so you have to uh, adapt to what the market is paying out right. and um uh, yeah, and just be realistic. Don't expect more than you than you're gonna get. You're you're not the first person to tell me the markets have become more difficult recently. I actually still am friends with a lot of my prop futures friends, and some of them are leaving the industry. They're going and, and trading at major firms now, as opposed to trading their own money, just because they're like it's too difficult to make money day in day out. Why do you think that is? Uh, firstly, I totally agree. Well. As I say, the volatility has decreased. You know, like I said, the Bund used to move 150 point uh, ticks in a day. <laughs> now sometimes it'll move 30, you know, 40, 50. So yeah, generally I think uh, volatility is reduced, um, and I think the whole QE thing and the government and the central banks just having such a big impact on the markets now, trying to control everything that it's just killed it. So you know, do you think markets uh, become more efficient, or they're just so controlled now by? by the Fed and, and the other major banks? I think it's controlled. I think 
liquidity is dried up. I don't think the banks get anywhere near involved as they used to. They can't anyway, can they? You know, with all the um, restrictions they have now, they can't have the have trade the way they used to. Uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty dumb. But I think that's what governments want. I don't I don't think they want volatile markets. I think they want uh, it's the way they want it. I guess. Do you yeah. think it's do you think it'll ever snap? So say if the Fed comes out and the U.S. Fed at least, and they either go negative interest rates or they surprise and actually raise them. Do you think we'll get a major volatility swing for a extended period of time? Not in the foreseeable future, no. You know, in, in my day, they used to move interest rates by half a basis point when they moved them, <laughs> and they didn't telegraph the move, so it was awesome. Well, <laughs> I say awesome, Some sometimes it wasn't so awesome when I was having a quiet beer in the pub at two in the afternoon, suddenly the Bank of England wrote, you know, <laughs> hikes rates 50 basis points and I'm tearing up the escalator in the life exchange to find I've gone and lost tens of thousands of pounds while I, you know, by the time I've got to the top of the escalator, that, oh. that ain't so so much fun. But um, <laughs> When, when was some, that? Um, yeah, I've, I've had situations like that <sighs> where, uh, where, you know, whereas nowadays, of course, you know, you know when the meeting is, you know when the announcement's coming and you pretty much know what's going to happen because they've telegraphed it for months. So yeah, I mean that's another reason why it's difficult. You know, there's less less impact for traders. Uh, those days won't come back where 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 you got the surprise moves. I mean that's probably it's probably a good thing. You know, we need certainty in our lives, don't we? We don't need these sudden unexpected <laughs> but, unexpected announcements. I guess maybe from a day to day standpoint, but from a trading standpoint, it's nice. I, I personally feel like I've only traded one really highly volatile period of time: um, the flash crash a couple of years ago. I got sure. fortunate enough to be be sitting in front of my screen at that time and mm. at the board and be able to trade it, and I mm. felt like that was like the easiest trade in the world. It's like, oh no, mm. no, you can literally put bids and offers on both sides of the market and get hit on both of them. You're just like, sure, all day long. Terrific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it'll happen again. The stock market will crash again. You know, um, it'll you know we'll we'll have our period of volatility again, no doubt. But as far as central banks controlling things, I think they've killed the ball. Do you think the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates in the near future? I know they've somewhat been hinting at it, then they take it away when the market reacts, and then they put it back in. They've sort of been all over the place with it. I, yeah, I honestly don't have an opinion, and I've given up trying to work it out. I honestly couldn't care less what they do anyway. It's not going to affect my positions. You know, before the meetings, I close my stuff out just in case something happens that is unexpected. There's no point in me running a position over an FOMC meeting. I mean, it's got to be the most boring story in the world. <laughs> How long have we been talking about the Fed raising rates and they've done it once? I've had, I've had interviews like this, I don't know, three years ago or something, you know, and people going, oh, do you think they'll raise rates? And I'm like, God, who cares now? And even if they do, they're going to put them up, what, 25 basis points. I mean, woohoo, you know, who cares? It's just not going to change the world. You know, and if they put them up, they put them up and then, then what? Nothing. So... Uh, I just think it's such a boring uh, subject, you know. Right. You know, and everyone's everyone's obsessed with it, and it it's just not going to make it much of a difference to anybody, as far as I can see. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, I'm no, being no, I, I, I agree. It's, bo it's boring the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. At this point, because it's been out there so much, they really can't make a change in a major direction either way. It's got to be such an incremental change. It's not, you know, can't be a half basis point, full basis point. Okay. It's it's got to be very small, ease into the market, and then sure. see how the market reacts. And ultimately, exactly. you know, I, I personally think they're going to mess up the markets, uh, at least here in the States. Uh, you know, they've, they've propped it up for too long. They've put so much money behind it. I think they even came out the other day and said, if they raise interest rates, more than likely they're going to have to do another round of QE just to keep the market stable. Uh, I can I can find the article and send it to you. I I read it's lots just, of articles. I, I love sure. love Zero Hedge. Yeah, um, yeah, oh, yeah. That's that's a great website. Do you read any uh, websites yourself? Yeah, I often get caught up in it, in, you know, in the evening and go through all that stuff, find stuff on Twitter to read. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy following it. Um, I just sometimes I just think I, mean, I I couldn't really get my head around all this QE and how you know, I know I'm an old man, so. Uh, <laughs> You know, but this is just so far beyond what I could have possibly ever imagined happening in the world. You know, 10 years ago, if you'd have said to me, ah, oh, stock markets are going to be at ridiculous record highs and obviously the bond market would be where it is now and QE and, you know, negative interest rates. <laughs> I'd just be like, if, 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 if I went to the movies and saw a movie about that, about how, how the economy had developed, I'd be like, that's the most stupid movie I've ever seen. I mean, how, how can that situation ever ever exist you know and then 
and then we're in it. So I, I don't know what happens next. I just can't imagine. So do you think this is the craziest thing you've ever seen or have you seen crazier things in this industry? I've seen crazy markets, which have been terrific fun. You know, I've seen everything since the October 1987 crash. So I've seen that. Uh, uh, I didn't trade that myself, but I did trade uh, the ERM crisis in um, the UK when the pound was pushed out of the ERM mechanism. That was a fantastic week. Um, I've, I've, I, that worked really well for me. And then I got caught on the Russian bond default uh, uh, in 1998. So that wasn't great for me. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've seen some great stuff. Is that that's about the book when Genius failed? Is that the same Russian bond default? Yeah, I think so. It was around the Asian crisis. I mean, it's twenty years ago now, so it's a little bit foggy in my head. I just I just remember losing a load of money, um, <laughs> and then you know the the crash of two thousand and uh, the crash of two thousand and eight. So yeah, I, I've traded it all. I've seen it all. That was great, but um, yeah, I don't know what happens next. And uh, that's, I, I always like to ask people this, you know, you, you mentioned you, you lost a lot of money and sorry if it's a, if it's a painful subject. No, to I don't mind. What, what is your worst trade ever and what did you learn from it? Uh, wow, I got so many bad trades. <laughs> <laughs> well, that particular trade was me being short a lot of volatility in the option market. So I was trading short sterling options and um, I had a position on... It was August. I was getting a bit complacent, actually. Um, I had quite a good year, made quite a lot of money, kind of thinking about I was going to wind it down for Q4. Um, yeah, and I was short, short, short a lot of out the money calls. And yeah, as they say, got my ass handed to me on a plate. Uh, I wasn't actually even in the country. I'd gone on holiday. I guess that's how complacent I was. And I should have been covering my shorts. Anyway, yeah, that was horrible. That was a big sum of money. Is yeah, that when you much. learned to start trading smaller size? Uh, no, that was me being backed by someone else. <laughs> so I was kind of paid to trade bigger size. Um, but that was a lesson in discipline, really. I guess, uh, how does that affect you, trading other people's money versus trading your own? Does that have any mental issues on um, you? I was certainly less disciplined when I was trading someone else's money. I mean, it was a different market completely. Uh, you know, the opportunities were there, the spreads were wider, the, um, the volatility was bigger. Uh, well, I think if you trade for a bank, you don't really understand too too much about account management. You know, that's something you really learn as a retail trader. You know, if you've got five grand in your account, you have to make that last. Right. You know, and if, if you're trading with backing and, okay, you know, I had days when I would lose six figure sums, but, you know, I knew that, you know, well, I didn't get sacked, so... Uh, um, you know, that the, the, my backer would still be behind me and say, get back in the pit, you know, and I, that happened on more than one occasion. Uh, but in the end, I usually got it back. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, as a retail trader, you, you have to be far more focused on what's in your account, how much you're risking uh, and really, really maintain, you know, and not get blown out. You know, it, it, the key is to, to, to survive this trade again tomorrow. Right. So obviously, risk management is uh, very crucial on the retail side and, and every side, really. Um, certainly retail side, nothing else matters more than your account management, your risk management, you know, your trade management. You know, um, you just, you, you can be wrong more than, than you're right as long as you're managing your trade properly and managing your account properly. Uh, you know, you, you can actually be more than 50% wrong on, on your on your trades, uh, you can lose more than, more than, you know what I'm trying to say, you can lose on more than 50% of your trades, but you can still come out with a profit if, if, you're, uh, if, you're risk, if you're managing everything properly. Well, I know a lot of trend followers are that way, where they'll be wrong, small, wrong, small, wrong, small, wrong, small, right one time and make all exactly. the money back plus double the, or triple the, the position. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's a perfect example. Uh, do you, you mentioned, uh, the pits a couple times. Do you miss the pit trading? I know it's sort of a dying breed at this point. I know they closed everything with the option pits in Chicago, uh, as a couple months ago. But yeah. Did you miss being down there? Uh, I, I, it was a time of my life. You know, I, I was just really lucky. I was in the right place at the right time at the right age. And, uh, yeah, what an opportunity. I had terrific guys down there. You know, I had some good friends and, you know, made some money. And I was in the middle of London, at, you know, in my early 20s. Um, it, was, it was fantastic. But, 
you know, after a while, you just think, God, I just can't keep doing this every day. You know, when you start, <laughs> start hitting your 30s, and I mean, you know, I'm nearly 50 now, so there's no way I'm going back on a training floor now. So I can't say I miss it. I'm just very grateful to have experienced something pretty unique. Yeah, that's, uh, I sort of regret not coming into the industry earlier. I know one of my brothers kept trying to convince me to come to Chicago when people right. were still pit trading. Like, right. oh, you know, I just don't want to live in a big city. It's not for me. Sure. And then finally, sure. you know, he, I had two brothers trading the time in 2008. They both had crazy years and they're like, you right. have to come up. I'm like, yeah, I saw, saw how much money they made. I'm like, okay, I'll be up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm there. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I definitely wish I, I could experience the pits, uh, at least a couple times. It, yeah. From what was, I've was been great. told, it's like just a different trade completely where you're not really trading the markets, you're trading the person next to you or across from you. Yeah. It, it was, just the most exciting time you know I'm, you know uh i'm sure traders these days trade way bigger than i ever did you know there's a lot more money in the system and traders you know i'm sure they make way more money than i did you know i i did okay I, I wasn't one of the best traders on the floor but um but it was just yeah brilliant and it just just being in the pit you know the banter the chat in you know it was just when when the markets were quiet you're just laugh, laughing and having some fun and and the, you know just the bars the just the aggression everything loved it fantastic <laughs> but those days are over yeah those are back back to the screens back to yeah. uh, sitting in your sitting in your house sitting outside sure. by the pool trading on oh, you the know. laptop you know, now you've got the freedom. So I, I guess I'm also lucky that I'm now able to trade off a laptop and, and and carry my business around me. You know, I can take my family on holiday for two weeks and I can still get up in the morning, do my thing, and then, go, you know, still make, make a bit of money, hopefully, and then go off with my family for the day. So, yeah, I guess now I'm lucky that I can do this, you know. It's all, it's all kind of worked out well, actually, thinking about it now. Wow. You got to experience the floor, and yeah. now you get to travel yeah. and, and be with your family. I'm, maybe I'm only appreciating it as I'm talking to you now that actually throughout my life, things have just, uh, you know, technology's helped me along at the right stage. Yeah. Uh, where do you think the, the markets go from here? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I only really focus in the very, very short term at the moment because I just, I think long term is, it's, just too hard to predict. I, I loved to predict longer term and I, I'd often call the top in a market or a major bottom in a market, actually call the bottom in gold at the beginning of the year and silver. Uh, but right now, long term, I really haven't got a clue. I think gold comes off probably a little bit, maybe down to 1300, 1297, but I think that's a really good support area. And I think gold is going to continue. I think gold's now in a bull trend. Silver, I think, uh, yeah, silver's had a good one, which uh, happily uh, caught that. I think that comes off a little bit more. I think that corrects possibly down to 1830, 1820, and then that takes off again. So I think gold and silver remain my best, uh, you know, uh, I trade ideas for the year. Stock markets, I've got no idea. I know everyone, you know, so many people think they're going to collapse, and I know all the, some of, you know, the big guys, Mark Farber and George Soros and Carl Icahn and all these guys are calling for huge stock market crashes. They're all short up to you know massive shorts and i'm, I'm certainly not going to say they're wrong I, i'm never going to bet against clever people like that i'm not i'm not a smart guy but i'm not seeing anything on my charts telling me to get short right now and i, and I don't think that we're just going to wake up in the morning and see everything crash i think it'll be a very a slow process i think you know generally market it's build into a bear market they don't just you don't just wake up one day and everything's dropped 30 percent. so right, right now I, I don't Right now, I don't see any reason to say that otherwise, other than crazy fundamentals, but I think that's going to take time to play through. Um, other than that, you know, most, so many of the Forex markets are trading sideways, the Euro, the Aussie, you know, the pound's a different story because it's got the whole Brexit thing going on. Um, yeah, those, that's pretty much it. You know, I don't have any strong feelings about any currencies particularly. Okay. And you mentioned you called the, the gold and silver. Was that in your daily report? Yeah, I was banging on about that for a long time, but it wasn't just my customers. I made it quite well known. You know, I published some articles and I write, wrote, wrote, write for a couple of blogs, so I tried to make it well known. Um, you know, it was, it was just a very simple technical analysis, nothing clever. We just hit some big support levels that really should have held, and they did. Um, the silver had a really nice... Anyone can go back and have a look at their, their silver charts. Look at the weekly silver chart, and it's just pretty obvious that there was a massive bottoming pattern going on. I don't, know, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was an inverse head and shoulders. I don't know whether it was a cup and handle. I think it was a combination of a two, two or three different patterns, but it was telling me that this is definitely going up. So, um, so I think anyone that studies technical analysis would have seen that anyway. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm pleased with those calls at least. And you mentioned you write for blogs, you have your website. Uh, where can people find you if they ever want to get a hold of you? Okay, uh, on Twitter I'm at DayTradeSignals and my website is DayTradeIdeas.co.uk so that's uh, the best way to find me. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can get you can sign up to my course on there, uh, or you can subscribe to reports. I, I I also post free reports on there almost every day, just so that people see what our subs subscribers get. And a lot of people go there every day and just make make money off off my reports for free. They don't even pay me, so you know uh, you can do that too. <laughs> you can't beat free. <laughs> well, you know you got to you got to give free stuff away for free these days, haven't you? So, uh, uh, seem, it seems like that in the, the retail side where, you know, they don't quite understand how valuable the reports are until they at least get to try them for a little while. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, actually for retail traders, there is so much that's, that's free out there. You know, you, you can educate yourself if you can be bothered to trawl through loads of rubbish. You know, there is so much free stuff out there to educate yourself. Uh, if you don't want to trawl trawl through all the rubbish you can come to me and sign up for my course <laughs> <laughs> actually i'm also running a um, the, this is the first time i've ever done this but i've been asked to uh run like a mentoring week so i'm going to fly back to my villa in spain and i'm getting people to come to fly in to spain in soda grande which is where i have my villa come and spend a week with me and just run through everything and i'll try and teach people everything i've ever learned in 30 years so um it's only a thousand pounds for the week so I think that's about as cheap as anyone will ever find mentoring from a guy who's been doing it for 30 years. Do you have any information on that that I could publish uh, after, just so people wanted to check it out? I haven't even published it because it's kind of an invite-only thing to my clients. Ah, okay. But if anyone wants to contact me either through my uh, Day Trade Signals Twitter account or contact me on my website, then... I can try and find some room to slot people in. <laughs> well, honestly, it's, it's, sleep it's good on the couch, sleep on the floor. Yeah, yeah they'll, exactly. They'll figure exactly. it out. <laughs> we'll make it nice and cozy. Nice. All right. Well, that sounds interesting. I was I was going to ask you where, where you're at with your current business, but that that pretty much answers it. Uh, do you have yeah, anything else that's going on with your your business right now and your trading? Uh, no. What I should really do is focus more on the trading. I've been asked to you know offer a copy trade service, not just the the copy trade service that I have where you where you see my best trades for the day on my spreadsheet, but I've been asked to do a copy trade service to people who are too busy to trade. Right. You know, I've been, I've been a bit lazy about doing that because I don't necessarily trade all day every day. You know, I'm kind of at the age where I don't want to have to do it all day every day. You know, like a friend of mine said just, <laughs> just an hour ago, said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm going out on my on my boat around, you know, some of the islands around Phuket, do you want to come? So I'm like, oh yeah, done. <laughs> you know, so I don't really, I want to be able to have that freedom to do that or see my kids or, you know, go and watch my kids at school or, or something, not not have to trade all the time. So right. I don't know, maybe I'll pull my finger out and do it eventually. <laughs> you, you could always ride an EA from T4. <laughs> seems yeah, to be the yeah way. exactly. <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah, I'm going to have to have someone help me with that because I'm absolutely hopeless <laughs> with any form of technology. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, my dogs are starting to whine back here. Um, okay. It's about 40 minutes in. I, I appreciate your time. Um, I'll, I'll publish your information down here at the bottom of the screen just so if people want to get Thank in you. contact with you, they can. Uh, but it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate you taking the time, having, having a glass of wine with us. I'm not, I'm, I've been talking so much. I'm not out of sit. Cheers. Well, I appreciate it. You have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Trent. Really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks, All buddy. Right. Thanks. Bye now. I think that was